Well, welcome everyone to our Sturbridge Historical Society meeting. This is our last meeting of this year. Um, we're going to wind up with a pretty good one. Um, just a couple of notices. First of all, once again, we'd love to thank the uh, public house for their gracious hospitality for providing this space. And uh, I see you found the refreshments over there, so uh, it's uh, greatly appreciated, and uh, we thank you. In fact, Michael Flick is right here. He's one of the managers of the building. So Mike, on me, Mike, so I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> we will be having a program planning meeting for our program for next year. That will be on Wednesday, June 12th at 6.30, right across the street at the Joshua High Library. Uh, we just brainstorm and come up with programs that we'd like to do for next year. We already have a number of them. We met once already, but we We'll be meeting again on Wednesday, June 12th, and we invite anyone who would like to participate or come with ideas, uh, please, please join us. June 8th, I think it's a Saturday at 9 a.m., uh, there'll be a tour of the Sturbridge Common. Sandy Gibson Quigley will be conducting it, roughly an hour and a half walk. Uh, she has done a lot of research on the buildings, the space, the library, and you will probably learn a lot of what's there. Weather permitting, but I was hit to watch out for people that do that. A reminder, posters of the uh, agricultural fair, you saw one uh, mounted, they are for sale. We see they're selling for $30, they're reproductions. Uh, Bob Arnold has the original, it's a beautiful uh, image of the Sturbridge Agricultural Fair, which was held right where the host is now, and that was the fairgrounds. Tonight we're having a, a program on World War II, right here at the public house. It's, um, World War II saw American society rally behind the war effort as the nation geared up to be the arsenal of democracy. All, communi all communities experienced changes as citizens and businesses did their part. Wally Hersey of the Sturbridge Historical Society will discuss the role of the public house in World War II. Initially, the inn became the defense center for the training of civilians and the state guard. Eventually, it became the first service command tactical school for the training of army officers in guerrilla tactics. The presentation will also look at the 366th Regiment, the Women's Defense Corps, and the type of training they underwent. The second half of the program will be showing of a newly enhanced film of the Sturbridge Defense Center's dedication on October 25th, 1941, including the, quote, Battle of Sturbridge that was presented for the townspeople and the dignitaries of the day. Again, our friend Wally grew up in Medford where he refined his interest in local history. Having moved to Sturbridge, it was only a matter of time before he took an active part in the Sturbridge history. A photographer for more than 45 years, his 200, 2017 book, Follow the Light, tells of his photographic journey. While he retired as a registered nurse in 2019, at the age of 25, <laughs> today he lives in town with his wife Mary and is active on the town board, volunteers at Tanglewood, and writes for the Sturbridge Historical Society on their Facebook page. So most of the posting you see on our Facebook page is uh, the efforts of Wally. It's, it's some really great stories and photographs that appear on that. So again, this is our last meeting. Um, we uh, hope to see you at our planning meeting in June 12th. Or, I mean, I'm sorry, at, uh, when is it over? Yes, June 12th, and then the June 8th to walk on the common, tour on the common. So please welcome Wally Hurst. Intrigued me a great deal. 
more already to what I said. I, I don't work more about that. However, if I night job, I work seven to seven eight years for more than years I like to talk about, um, interfere with that. I couldn't do that until I retired. Tonight we're going to talk about that story of research that I've done. Most of you may know a lot about what happened here in 1941 to 1943. The uh, Sturridge Defense Center is where the first call was opened before World War II started. It was in October of 1941. And the reason it was, it was because the war had already started in Europe. In 1939, Poland had invaded. In 1938, Austria had been taken over by the uh, Axis powers, and Hitler had taken that over. And uh, it looked like things weren't going to go well for Britain at the time. So Britain was formulating, with all their troops overseas, in the Pacific and in Europe, they said, what happens if the Nazis did come to the British Isles? They had to have a home guard. So they formulated a home guard. They hired a couple of instructors that really knew their stuff, that had studied guerrilla warfare and had been guerrilla warfare uh, entrepreneurs in Nicaragua and other countries in Central America and around the world. Mostly, they were, they were like um, USA, well, soldiers were hired, but a couple of them were very, very talented. Um, they trained the British Home Guard, and what they had, they had millions of of British citizens that were trained in air raid protection and also self-defense. Um, self-defense is the island of themselves. So, the concept was two people from Massachusetts formed, Dr. Uh, I mean, Lieutenant Colonel uh, John Howard and H. Wendell Endicott. Endicott was a very wealthy man. His family had an Endicott shoe company and John Howard was a lawyer. And they had been part of the Massachusetts um, Committee for, uh, for Public Safety. Now that committee was the very same committee that put together all the militia for the Lexington and Concord battles, and the ones that formulated all that whole thing. And they had been forming, formed, and they had been inactivated several times over the couple hundred years. The World War I were active after the war were deactivated, but they had just been made active again in 1940. These two gentlemen went to England to study, to see exactly what was happening over there, what they could do to make Massachusetts safe again. Because heaven forbid, the Germans roll up on the shores of Cape Cod. And they had them, but the Germans did launch rafts from their few boats, and they did come to Cape Cod, and they shopped in Hyannis, and they, they went back to Germany after that. The, um, the Massachusetts State uh, the Commission, Committee for uh, Public Safety was extremely important for formulating a way to resist an invasion. What also happened in 1940 is that the Massachusetts National Guard was nationalized. In other words, up to that point, they only took care of Massachusetts because they weren't a federal entity. When things looked bleak overseas, they decided to make it a federal entity. And as a result, the Massachusetts State National Guard went overseas, and they were the first ones to respond when went to war. But that left Massachusetts without anybody to protect them. So what they ended up doing was they formulated the Massachusetts State Guard. The Massachusetts State Guard took the place. And that was mostly gentlemen. They were nine to fivers. They were plumbers and lawyers and everybody else. They didn't have, um, they weren't in it for a long term. They were just in it day by day. And they would be called up. If something happened, and their job was to protect Massachusetts. And the whole idea, the concept was to protect 30 to 40 miles inland in Massachusetts. Combat troops were made for combat. That's overseas. That's what they went to boot camp for. That's what they stressed for. That's what they learned how to jump on airplanes for. The Massachusetts State Guard was not that. They were. A group of men, men, there were several thousand of Massachusetts, that were tra trained to back up and hold off any invasion or anybody that came in here until the regular troops could come and rescue them. Essentially, that's what it was. The whole idea of the Massachusetts State Guard was to hit them 
work was coming after them, hit them hard, and they go run away and back and do it again. It really antagonized them. There was no other way to do it at the time. The Massachusetts State Guard was referred to as sort of orphans. Now, I want you to look at this picture. This is the Massachusetts State Guard in 1944, years after the war had started. And they're training in the Blue Hills in Canton, Massachusetts. I want you to look at the pants. The pants don't match. None of the pants match. They have hands that hold up. This gentleman here has his World War I outfit on. Most men that were in the uh, Massachusetts State Guard were World War I veterans. They were older. They were in their 40s, their 50s, 50 years old. They weren't young enough to go overseas. Look at their helmets. They're all World War I gold plate helmets, which the US Army used during the World War II as well. Not one of them is on straight. <laughs> They all left their jobs that afternoon, probably, and they all came down to work and work out and, and march and drill. When they formulated, most of them didn't even have weapons, they didn't have guns. They had wooden ones until they, they finally were able to get some that were left over World War I from the Armory in Springfield. Open to the storm, they were called. As they said, they had to be trained to adequately defend Massachusetts 30 to 40 miles inland. The civilian organization of guerrillas was needed to take out supplies and invasion. And to make this happen, you really just couldn't do it with regular U.S. Army. You had to do it with somebody else. And one of the ones they had was somebody who checked the British Home Guard. And that was this gentleman by the name of Burke. His nickname was Yank Levy. Now, he's kind of an interesting character. And sometime when you're at home, you end up to do Google him. Find him and read his backstory. It's quite interesting. But he was a, a gentleman who went over to train the British Home Guard and how to take care of their island through guerrilla warfare. It did more with guerrilla warfare men than men. The training place was needed. Initially, when they started this whole thing with the blessing of the Massachusetts Committee on Public Safety, they started in Concord at a school there. And somehow, a person recommended Sturbridge. Why not Sturbridge? Sturbridge apparently had a physical plant and 1,800 acres available for training. Now, the, the, the public house never had 1,800 acres around, around it. They had 1,800 surrounding the area that could be utilized. The picture you see off to the side here is a uh, Massachusetts a guard, a state guard, working on how to take concertina wire and make traps for any trucks. The public house went to war. The initial uh, purpose of the Sturridge Defense Center was to train civilians. And Captain Richard C. Page of the state civilian force in the State Guard and the owner of the public house at the time presented the property, this entire property, to George H. Robinson, Sturridge. He was the chairman of the Sturridge Committee on Public Safety. Now, that's interesting because um, Captain Richard Page, he was the Massachusetts State Guard as well, as owning this entire property. So he felt that by giving or lending this property to them for the school to train them the guerrillas, it was in the best interest of the company. It was very, that country was very, very patriotic. I'm also going to mention, as we go along, the Women's Defense Corps. They trained elsewhere uh, for duties as uh, air raid precautions, but they also were able to teach a lot of civilians. They taught, they were, they were trained in how to air raid precautions, canteen, motor, uh, motor pool communications. And the Women's Defense Corps, this I'm going to go into it, you'll see more about it a little bit later. Colonel Natalie Hayes Hammond formulated them. An interesting story about her is that anybody have to been to Gloucester and Magnolia and seen the Hammond Castle? All right, well, her brother built that. Her father was very, very wealthy, and her, and her family was extremely wealthy, and her, her brother John. He had already developed back in the 30s and 40s an awful lot of conventions for the U.S. government. And one of them was remote control. And remote control they used, the government used for controlling torpedoes at sea. So it been on, on their targets. She had been back and forth in Europe all her life, being a well-to-do child. 
And um, when World War II was on the horizon, she and her very wealthy friends in the, uh, uh, the North Shore decided they were going to get together and they got a organization to defend Gloucester at the end of the week. That didn't go off as so well. It just, she got some interest, she got a little interest, nothing really happened with it. But she went to the Massachusetts uh, Committee of, Sa of Public Safety and they agreed to her open arms and she just went to town with it. More on that in a minute. The barracks building and equipment were donated by Captain Richard Page the public house. He was an aide to General Harrison, the Adjutant General of Massachusetts, Captain Page had said, was the owner. The, uh, this here, the barracks, you can't go back there now, but it went way, way, way back there. And that's where the barracks was. Behind it, it was a mess house, I mean, uh, a sort of cafeteria uh, for the, uh, the troops as well. There's a parade ground down there. It's all flooded now. Palms Brook has been backed up by the years, and it's all flooded that whole entire area. There's very little usable land up here as, as it was back then, and you're going to see a little later on just how much land there was back there. To give you an idea exactly where things were in the public house in 1941. Now, so, how many were housed in those barracks? Initially, the very first few weeks, it was like 76 were the first class. 76 uh, 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 state guard were, were trained. And that, that barracks was extremely long. Um, it was, in fact, it's still here. In fact, the, the white houses you see in the parking lot, that was the barracks that was cut in half and placed up there in the hill. That was the embarrassing one. The mess hall was, was destroyed later on. But 76 to 80, later on, there was a couple hundred at the time that were also housed here at the time with the federal government and with the U.S. Army. And they stayed here in the, in the barracks there and also on grounds and, and houses um, it, within the, uh, the, the facility itself. Right here is the public house. Here's some orientation of where we are. There's a town common, Child Street. There's Hobbs Brook, Haynes Street right beside us, beside the uh, center office building. And this is Route 15, before 84 was here. That went up to uh, Route 131. The road that this is where you're supposed to be parked tonight, right here. And that road went down there. It's still there. That road is exactly the same. And goes up to Route 15. And this is the corner here is where the hotel was, the motel that was destroyed during the tornado in 2011. Down the road a little bit more was an infirmary for the State Guard and for the uh, United States Army. Right there. Right there is the infirmary. There's a town garage was up, up, up a little bit north. Right there. This whole land right here, that, that was the parade grounds. That's where the barracks and the defense center was, way down the end there. There is a bunker down there. It's still a concrete bunker down that area, too, that they have the munitions. The ammunition was stored. It's still there. <coughs> Off the brook, coming down from Crystal Pond, all the way down this way. This looks like that anymore. It's like a lake. And here's the Crinobar River coming out from behind the old Sturbridge Village. As I said, the Massachusetts Women's Defense Corps, when Natalie Hayes had been, been in that, had developed it, she set up the uh, women's uh, the, the school, and uh, she had some of the problems when she heard first set up. As I said, she's a well-to-do lady with a lot of well-to-do friends, and well-to-do friends who are very wealthy have a very hard time taking orders. So <laughs> a lot of them sort of threw up their hands and they, they gave their blessing to her and they went their own way. She had the uniforms designed by Abercrombie and Fitch. She also had Abercrombie and Fitch make the uniforms. You're going to see in a few minutes that she had uniforms and everything. They had an air raid person. And also, over here at the table afterwards, I have a, a pin. There's an ARP on it, there's an air raid person on it. They had, they had a pin in a, a uniform for anything they did radio, water pool, mess, firefighters. They just thought it was very important to do it that way. They weren't being paid, they're all volunteers. And a little bit of time, the school that 
was training the women's and women defense corps, grew to 100 locations throughout the Commonwealth. That's how much of a demand there was, and an awful lot of women gave the time. The Massachusetts Women's Defense Corps became less reliant upon in 1943, when the wax and the waves and everything else were federalized, and they sort of said, like, they weren't going to be using the federal state any longer. This, this uh, still picture is interesting. The wax and the wasps and the waves and the spars were all segregated. They're all white organizations. Massachusetts Women's Defense Corps wasn't. And they didn't even thought of it as ever having to be segregated. Very important because of the time and era of the time. This photo here is right outside, right out front. There's the Haynes, Haynes Street, runs of those two buildings. There's the center office building. Town Hall is right there. These are the uniforms. The air raid person, firefighters, best hall workers, they all marched. It was a different time. I put this in here purposely because they're very involved with the defense center in the very, very beginning, the Herod Servers. This photograph was photographed by famous photograph photographer Ansel Adams. Now, if you don't know what Ansel Adams, Ansel Adams is somebody who became famous with his black and white photographs of national parks and a variety of other things. His use of light was impeccable with black and white in his great times. The government asked him to take pictures, and he spent quite a long time in Massachusetts taking pictures of the women's defense support. Not to be all done. How many of you grew up using Pond's cream or Pond's lotion? Okay, that was a very, very popular thing. Well, if you're going to attract a woman, you're going to have to use some personal things here to the Pond's cream. This young lady here was in the uh, Massachusetts uh, Defense Corps. Her name was, uh, El uh, her last name was Otis. I talked to her, her grandfather was assigned to the Declaration of Independence. She's from Massachusetts, obviously. And she had just become engaged. Well, because she used pawns. <laughs> this is the type of things that you would do. Photography of Ansel Adams, so many uniforms, personal care items, and even their um, That was designed by them as well. This picture here is showing that this is in. Uh, I believe this is in Needham, Massachusetts. This is in Needham. That's in Lexington. And I believe this is down in Canton. You know, all over the country, all over the state, training. And it's that pin that I spoke about, you see right over there. Now, this gentleman I talked to you about before, Yank Levy. The British described him as a delightful combination of Daniel Boone and Jack the River. <laughs> His specialty was unqualified murder. And that's exactly what he was. That's what he was famous for. He taught that to the little lady who sold tea in her tea room in, in little the Cotswolds in England. And he taught her husband when he's out there bringing the sheep in. They gave him a helmet and an arm band and a rifle and they taught him how to take care of their land. And he did it was very, very effective. So over a million British citizens were trained in the of warfare. So when his, his time was done over there, he also talked about how he was explosive and angry age too. He, 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 he was quite thorough. That's why I think in the 1950s, not many grandchildren gave their grandparents a hard time in Britain. Now, his photograph there, if you notice his nose is sort of deviated to the west, he sees some action in his life. He had, he had the very best teachers to come over here to Massachusetts, and the ones that were in Massachusetts already. He had Mr. Spears of the Boy Scouts of America. He taught the folks here at the State, at the state Guard how to camouflage and how to track and how to do things out of the woods that you would expect a Boy Scout to do. That was one of the courses that were taught here. He all, they also were taught um, how to uh, 
Gary? It sadly happens. Different people do it. You get in contact with. It's booked the day lasted from 6.30 in the morning to 10 o'clock at night. There's an area right there as far as the uh, six, six guards, but the very first ones are there. Um, stabbings, gouging, and the Marquis of Queensbury rules were sort of left at the door if you're teaching everybody. Um, as he said, our work here is done in England. England can't be invaded. The Hun cannot land any planes in England without facing hundreds of men waiting for them. And in Massachusetts with the same promise. You see them. Here, they're training the soldiers how to use their olfactory and their sense of smell when they're in the woods to smell things. You think, what is it smelling for? Well, gunpowder. Pat petrol, gasoline, different smells. American gasoline at the time smelled entirely different than it was being burned than German gasoline. That was one of the things. Not that the German truck was going to come down here, but that's what they were preparing for. They were preparing for them to be unloaded and onto the shores and coming right down Route 2 and Route 20. In Bolton, like other places around the Commonwealth, they would put up demonstrations on a regular basis of the graduates of school to show that everybody that was out there what was being taught and to give them encouragement to, to say that we're, we're in good hands. The FBI was here as well, right here at the public house teaching about potential fifth column action. In other words, the sleeper cells, people who were put here years and years before waiting for something to happen. In World War I, we learned a hard lesson with a lot of sabotage done by the Germans and blowing up boats in New Jersey and other different ports around the country. They didn't want that to happen here. The state police were taught. The average plumber who was coming for the weekend to study here, how to use a submachine gun, which would encourage an awful lot of people here in town to pay their bills on time. The civil defense classes were given under control of the civilian population. And each week, the 152nd Observation Squadron did a fly, and, the, and the first Observation Squadron did flyover exercises up there. They came out from uh, Hanston, they came out from uh, uh, Westover Air Force Base, and they would drop bags of flour out there as the troops were training out there. There are a couple of people here in the room that remember those. These are the tools of the trade. There's a Life Magazine table over there. And um, these photographs are from that Life Magazine. Telling you about him. Anything to become a weapon. This is how they show how to make hand grenades. Molotov cocktail. Three things they were really pushing was how to scout be in the lookout for something in out of the woods or in the roads, always be aware. Like right now, if you see something, say something, the same thing about scouting. Defend. How to dig a trench, how to hide yourself, how to camouflage. And this is the last picture shows how to stop. And it will show you how to do that. From October 25th, 1941, and through most of the year of 1942, the Massachusetts State Guard was here at the public house. And they trained an awful lot of men. <laughs> an awful lot of women came through and they went inside the defense court as well. This is the emblem of the shoulder patch of the first service command of the United States Army. They came here in the fall, the early fall, late summer, early fall of 1942. And they stayed in the, right through 1943. This stone here is, is placed in front of the town hall, in front of the honor roll. This is interesting. 
I thought this, I, 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 I've got to be able to share this. The postcard you see here is a public house in 1941. The postcard was written by a soldier, a sergeant, in the valley, who went on to become a painter for the rest of his life, by the way. He sent me to a, a friend of his up in New Hampshire who's been hospitalized. He just says, hello, just a car, just cheer you up a little, hope you are feeling much better. How do you like, how do you like, uh, how do you like the place that I'm staying in? And he cited Woody. It's dated September 9th, 1942. It didn't actually take off as being officially the service command tactical school until several days later. So they, and there's only training officers at the time. And he was a non-com, so he was a non-commissioned officer. So he was here before the end, setting things up, getting the barracks ready, getting the mess hall ready, getting everything done. This black and white photograph is the a picture of the, the regular U.S. Army. And they're out there in the back of the barracks, way in the back, as I said to do. They're in December, looking very, very warm. That's the mess hall in the back. And that's the barracks. It was quite extensive. The First Service Tactical School, the First Service Command was New England. There were nine of them in the country during World War II. The U.S. Army arrived in Nepal, and the State Guard was still being trained, but the U.S. Army were very impressed about how they were being trained. So they sent their, their, uh, their troops here, their officers being trained as well. Pretty soon, each one of the service commands had their own school within the year. Now this picture here is, is kind of interesting because this here are the officers in the back of the public house, right there. Right that back line. And what's unusual about this at the time, this is the uh, officers of the 366th. The 366th was a black regiment. They weren't a segregated regiment. They were a separate uh, 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 regiment. They had their own officers, general who led them. They answered to nobody. They answered only to the First Service Command headquarters in Boston. They had their own mess department, their own medical hospital, field hospitals, overflow, guns, artillery. They had it all. They weren't the Buffalo soldiers, which didn't have those. They had everything. Everything the white troops did. They trained here. They trained very, very well here. There are four devils. Now, this photograph is interesting too. This gentleman here, and I'll show you a little bit more about him in a few minutes. His name is Lieutenant James Fox. This gentleman here is Lieutenant Graham H. Jenkins. The only white gentlemen you can see here are the ones from the Massachusetts Convenience Public Safety. They trained here for a couple of weeks and everything, they, everything was trained in. But these two gentlemen were special. And I'll get into more about it in a second. These are some of the certificates that the soldiers would receive attending the school for one thing, and then being taught how to fight fortifications. This is what they got. One of those gentlemen I spoke to you about in the, the black and white picture being the first, first circle was Lieutenant James Fox. Lieutenant James Fox trained here. He was shipped overseas in 1944. In the fall of 1944, the 366 marched north in, in Italy up along the western coast to a town called Sola Colonia. 
They occupied that for some time. But the Germans began to rally down the bases at the, the village. And they started to attack. The American soldiers that were in the village decided to retreat, go down the hill, regroup, and go back and, defend, and, 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 and fight them. Lieutenant James Fox stayed behind. He stayed behind and directed the artillery into the village to take care of the invading Germans. He kept on calling in the shots until they got closer and closer and closer. They were being very effective. Finally, at the other end of the radio, the people that were firing the shots told me to get out of there. He said, keep it coming, keep it coming, you're getting it. And they did. The following morning when the Americans retook the village, they found over 100 dead Germans and they found Lieutenant Fox had died also in the barrage. He was recommended for Distinguished Service Cross for his gallantry that day. That was in 1944. In the winter of 1945, the 366 was broken up and spread to other, other groups. And when they were over there, they were no longer answering just the Sur First Service Command in Boston. They were under the 92nd Division, which was the Buffalo Soldiers. A lot of the records went awry. World War II records were kept very pristine and very, very accurate, except for the, the, uh, the records that were lost in the big fire years later for the Veterans Administration. Most of the records were kept. But this organization, the 366, and many of the records were lost. His distinguished cross was never given to him. On January 13th, 1997, his widow Arlene received the Medal of Honor posthumously for her husband. Because a lot of the documents were found. And they, they created a paper trail and they found it and they gave it to be awarded awarded her the medal that he was long overdue. Lieutenant James Fox. Appropriate. Now I want to share uh, another story. This morning I got up early on, two had a things and appointments to do. One of them was to be the old burial ground to recognize the Revolutionary War veterans that Mr. Robert Greer does every year with the school children from Burgess. And I had a, a meeting this afternoon, but before the meeting I received an email. I received an email from a neighbor. Now I live on a nine house cul-de-sac. That's it, just nine families. Two doors down from me. Um, and in the uh, email was a uh, a story and also a, um, some pictures. Her grandfather, Lieutenant Graham H. Jenkins, this gentleman right here, down below Lieutenant Fox, was killed in Italy two days after James Fox. He was awarded the Silver Star. We're fortunate enough tonight to have his granddaughter here and his daughter. One of the gentlemen who put together the, all the information for the 366 was a Dr. James Pratt, his father had served and survived 366. But based on all the, the records that were missing, he took it upon himself to find what happened to those soldiers. Where were they buried? How did they die? And he shared with me the booklets you'll see over there afterwards of all the ones that he found in all their graves. One of the people listed in there is Lieutenant Rick Jenkins. And his story is in there as well. I want to take a second to read this to you. First Lieutenant Infantry, United States Army, 
for gallantry on December 28th, December 1944, in Italy. Lieutenant Jenkins' platoon was deployed on an exposed knoll 300 yards in front of the remainder of his battalion. After 24 hours of artillery and machine gun barrage, the enemy launched a deadly offensive at the battalion positions. They resisted the enemy with fierce determination. He killed several of the enemy soldiers and attempted to storm the position during a lull on the artillery and fire and expose himself to help drag three of his wounded machine gunners to comparable safety. Upon being ordered to withdraw, First Lieutenant Jenkins refused to leave the unevacuated wounded, which now numbered over 50% of his platoon, unable to walk. He continued to direct the counterfire and care for the wounded, and his ammunition was exhausted, and every man in his platoon. But one had become a casualty, and he himself was wounded. When the enemy closed in around his position, he was still lying, trying to comfort a severely wounded soldier. The first Lieutenant Jenkins, intrepid valor in the face of overwhelming odds, exemplified the conspicuous gallantry of the American soldier. He entered the military service in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Mrs. Elizabeth Jenkins was his wife. She gave birth to her daughter that month that he died in Italy. We're honored to have his daughter, Mrs. Porter, and her husband, Mr. Porter, and their daughter, Heather Adams, here with us tonight. If you would join me just to acknowledge them and to thank them for his service. Graham Jenkins, and to recognize his heroism. I appreciate that. Defense Center, now we're going back in time again, 1942 to 1942 to 1941, and it opens with the Defense Center in October. Sir? This is the program of all the speakers that were there that day. Governor Robert Sack Saltonstall was supposed to be here, but he had a pressing engagement. He could not make it. He was very upset that he could not be here. This is the actual program. Newspaper articles around the country talked about the marching feet, the roar of the army bombers, the crackling of the fires. They did hear how to display what happened. This ribbon I found a number of years ago, and all the delegation wore those. This is a view of the back of the public house in 1941. Now what I'm going to show now is it's a film. It's a 16 millimeter film that's been around for a number of years, but it's in very poor condition. And I got a hold of one from Michael Blick here at the public house. Michael, if you heard you met him earlier on, and I had it cleaned up and digitized. It's a color film. It shows an awful lot. You're gonna. I hope you really enjoy it. But one thing that was lacking. It was lacking sound. To do it justice and to pay respect for those in the film, you really don't want to do a hack job, but you have, you've got to be able to hear something to um, acknowledge, acknowledge those that were in it. So I tried. If you can't hear the sound, let me know. I'll just pop my microphone in front of that little speaker right there. <laughs>
what you're seeing here is the people using the, uh, the presentation of the speeches. Which I had uh, Richard Page, the owner of the public house, <coughs> was very proud of what they had all done. So this day, this, this, this presentation of was hidden giving this saw there with the women coming down. That's the road you see. Yeah, right here. That goes down the far. two parts of the ceremony that day. The presenting of the property to the steward, um, public safety committee, and also to demonstrate to the town and to those who are here. Well, you don't know what that building is right there. Is that looking north toward the public house, or is that looking the other way at one of the barracks? You know, it's funny you should say that. I believe what they're doing here is that's, that's looking toward the northwest. Northwest, okay. So the that direction there. Yep. From where they are. The top <coughs> brook is probably running along the edge where the wood line was on the far side of the field, I bet. Yeah. I think the uh, Hodge Brook is over this way. Way off to the right, maybe. Yeah. It's hard to imagine. That there was all meadows here. Yeah, yeah, just cut all the trees down. <coughs> we'll see in a second. Thank you. 
defense for to show their skills, acquire every skill to build it up. If you look, if you watch them getting the stretches ready, they were quite skilled and they, they, they didn't waste any time at all. They put them around and exactly like This is the Red Cross right here. which was put on for the benefit of those dignitaries that were here and showed them what they could do. 
Trees, because they're, they're using the, the bolts, I think, yeah. They're older than the uh, and what the rats think. Right, they're older than the Program Wally was it one day or was it a weekend or just a one day program? One day event, yeah. It's coming, it's wrapping up. It's, it's uh, the uh, Valley School Bridge now, yeah. And we're going to end up doing the very end of the day. They did a the ticket service did an inspection of the grounds, you know, the barracks, right? They were. Getting the medals.
So that concludes the Battle of Sturbridge. But what did this whole defense center cost the U.S. government to rent? As I was doing my deep dive and looking around for information about the defense center, I found a number of uh, articles and documents. And one of them was this one here. This was, this was uh, came out in 1947, I believe. It was from the U.S. government. It was a tally of what exactly they spent on the different hotels around the country, around the world, on renting them when the military took over. Sturbridge Public House got, was uh, leased or rented for $16,000 a year. 1940, 41, 42, and 43, that's a, a good piece of change. So what does it look like now? The fields we spoke about. Right now, the parade ground, a little bit north of the lake, right, the parade ground is here, where the public house does their weddings and their outdoor ceremonies. The red barn that everybody goes at the very end of the property here. This is down behind the red barn. You can't get beyond there any longer because the road broke from the flooding caused by the beavers. The hops broke so we flooded it out. When I first came to Stewart in 2020, and then 2020, 2000, I could ride my bike down the, ro uh, the dirt road down there to the river. Almost to the munitions bunker, bunker down that way. You, you really couldn't do that now without really bushwhacking your way through the undergrowth, the overgrowth. This here is the Chamberlain Barn, which used to be up beside us over here before they, and they moved it down back seven years ago. The former barracks that we've been speaking about, which was the Defense Center building, was moved up in 1955 up here in the hill and split in half. It was rented out to uh, a family, a couple families down there, up to that point. But during the flooding of 1955, where everything just broke loose around here with the floods, it took a lot of water. So the whole house moved the building, split it in half, and rested it on a high point of the line there. And this is 1942. That's today. And that concludes our presentation tonight. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. I know we're getting a little bit later because we have any questions at all. Yes, sir. In the course of the war, how many people were trained or went through the And were they just from Massachusetts or after the fact of their team or the states? It's a great question. In the very, very beginning, from 19, October 1941 to about September of 1942, it was all State Guard, and there were several thousand that came, came through here to be, to be trained. Not much more than that. When the, when the U.S. Army came in and took over, they would send in, as you saw, the 366th Regiment came through. They'd come through at 150 at a time, and they did that every couple of weeks. So I would imagine that for the year and a half, almost two years that they were here, I don't have an exact number, but I would imagine it would be well over a thousand. Yes. Yes, ma'am. They take over the whole inn, or still function as an inn? That's a good question. Down there, where the buildings was, they, they, they had taken over. I heard also stories that they also took, used the house across the street in the corner of Charlton Street and, um, and Main Street. They use that as, as, as a part of their facility as well. As far as having, uh, maybe Michael, Michael, uh, we, did they take, did the uh, troops stay here in the building as well too? I can't answer that question, I, I'm not sure. I had read they, they did, they, they had 150 soldiers, they couldn't all fit in the barracks, but they did stay here as well, and they used across the street in conjunction with, as, as a best tent. Yes, Charlie. Across the street, that house was actually well since house. Yes. 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 So you had to change everything. <laughs> yes, sir. You still work with the group. At the barrel. 
words. Before I conclude tonight, I just want to I, I, I announce that if you already didn't know, uh, Mr. Um, Mr. Breer had his, his, his celebration in front of the old burial ground today for the fifth grade students. And we talked about that before in honoring the Revolutionary War dead with the geraniums as they do it every year for the past uh, seven years. And they needed to, to practice, they took over that they had, stuck, they had done in 1939 from the center office. He was also presented by Representative uh, Todd Smoller and uh, Senator uh, Fatman's uh, office a certificate of appreciation and an award given for his years of helping and, and, and supporting and working for the Stewart Historical Society and on his own, all the things he has done. So Mr. Brewer, thank you very, very much. We appreciate your time. And, uh, thank you very, very much, everybody. I really appreciate it. Thank you all. That was a great program, great, uh, great images of the local community right now. Uh, just a reminder, once again, uh, June 8th, Saturday, a tour of the Sturbridge Common, roughly one and a half uh, uh, hours walking. Uh, it's at 9 a.m. Then Wednesday, June 12th, uh, we're going to have a meeting at the Joshua High Library to plan programs for the next year at 6.30. Anybody is welcome to join us, just to brainstorm or bring ideas with you. Um, one more thing I forgot to mention earlier. September 3rd, Tuesday after Labor Day, uh, we're going to have Lafayette visiting Sturbridge, as he did on September 3rd in 1824. Everybody knows who Lafayette was? Very briefly, he was a young Frenchman who came and joined the American Revolution and became a very good friend and a staff member with George Washington, fought in battle, he was wounded at Brandywine. And returned to France for the 50th anniversary of the Revolution. They invited him to come back because he was so young he was able to make the trip. And he ended up touring all the original 13 colonies. He spent two years traveling. One of the highlights was helping to lay the cornerstone for the Bulky Hill Monument in Boston. They're recreating that visit on the same timetable, and on September 3rd of this year, he will be arriving, coming from Charlton. And we're going to have a program on the common. Physically, he's going to ride. We're going to have Sturbridge militia firing muskets, fife and drum music. Uh, he's going to come through a green arched way onto the common. And then I, I understand they're probably still in the works. They're going to have a meal planned in the evening that's open to the public for you know paying the cost. But uh, it should be a, a, a pretty big event, and it doesn't happen every time. So we return the bus. There's a blue sign down in the corner of the uh, common indicating uh, those events. So if you haven't seen it yet, check it out. But that's September 3rd, Tuesday after Labor Day, Lafayette's return. So thank you for coming. Enjoy your summer, and we look forward to seeing you next year. Thank you.